Isaiah had what is called a an experience with God. Just listen to me for a minute. An experience with God. And when he was in the presence of God, he discovered something. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. First of all, you need to see God for yourself. It's okay if mama sees him and daddy, but what about you? Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. How many of you all have seen the Lord at work in your life? I got one of you, man. I've seen the Lord. You may not have seen him physically. Because the Bible says no man can see God and live. But you've seen him at work. How he has kept you. When you should have flipped out and tripped out. You didn't give out. There wasn't your sedative. There wasn't Dr. Oz or Dr. Field. If the Lord hadn't kept you, you would not have been kept. The psychological warfare that you had to battle and grapple with, the monsters that you had to fight that nobody knows about, that you and God, the demons that continue to trample all over your emotions, if it had not been for the Lord. So you seen the Lord, amen. You seen the Lord not only psychologically, not only have you seen the Lord from a sociological perspective, but also from a physiological perspective, physiology. Which means you've seen the Lord work through your human anatomy. Your body would have broke down a long time ago if it had been for the Lord. He's a healer. Somebody say he's a healer. healer. He's healed your body. You've seen him at work. Heal your body. You've seen the Lord at work in your spiritual capacity as God begins to pour into your spirit. God has saved your soul, helped you to grow. Beyond measures, the old you doesn't live at the same address anymore. Come on, talk to me. I saw the Lord, and Deacon Tony, he said he was high and lifted up. Which means that when we surrender thanks and praise unto God, lift up your head. Look up toward heaven. Because he is high and lifted up. Heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. He is so high you can't get over him. So low you can't get under him. So wide you can't get around him. He said he was high and lifted up. And then once he saw the Lord, here he is right here. He said, I looked at myself. I saw him. And the more that I looked at him, I had to take a look at myself. Let me try it again. You ever met folk that's always pointing their finger the other way? That's because they haven't really seen the Lord. Let me try it again. When you really focus on seeing God, you ain't got time to be looking at nobody else but your own mess. Hello, somebody. Your own inadequacies. Your own faults. Your own fatal failures. He said, I saw the Lord and he was high and lifted up and I said, whoa, it's me. You ever done a woe is me? Woe ain't good. Woe is me. He said, for I am an undone man with unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. When he looked upon the holiness of God, he said, I'm just not fit to be in his presence. I'm unworthy. I'm inadequate. He said, woe is me. And he fell down before the Lord. True worship. Watch this. When you commune with God, you can't help but look at yourself. And true worship begins to reveal to you what you need from God and how inadequate you are to even worship Him. And so you surrender by saying He's just worthy to be praised. 
True worship is to cause you to change, to look at yourself, to grow. He said, woe is me, I'm undone, I'm almost done with this devotion, he says. But then I saw the seraphim, these angelic creatures flying around God, and with two wings they covered their face, and two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they fly. Why did they cover their face, Brother Cecil? I'm glad you asked me. They cover their face because no one is worthy to look upon God in his holiness. No one. Nothing. He said, we can't even look upon the glory of it. He said, this train filled the temple. And many of you ladies know what a train is. You see the train of a, of a wedding gown. And the train filled the temple. Just the glory of the train filled Temple. My prayer is that the glory of the Lord will fill the house. He said one of the seraphims took a coal from the fire and touched his tongue. How many of y'all get your tongue touched? Yeah, that's right. Touch me. The songwriter said, He touched me. He touched me. And now I am no longer the same. So this is our call to worship, our meditation, amen, to arrest your intellect and to invite your, uh, your attention to what God is saying to you on this blessed day. Malachi, we're going to just do a verse of this and then we're going to have um, meditation to pray today. We want you to pray today so you get everything said. He Touched me. This is over, but it still works. He he touched me, and oh, the joy. somebody, touch them by way of innovation, by way of your cell phone, 
text somebody, amen, send somebody a message and say, why aren't you in church, amen. Invite someone, if everyone reach one, amen, I believe God would be pleased, amen. We're going to start, amen, next Sunday, we're called One on One, One on One Ministry. What is One on One Ministry? We're going to give you some information to carry with you to pass out to some people in person, and I want you to see God at work. What do you mean, preacher? Everyone reach one. God is a one by one by one God. And so you're going to be challenged, amen, to reach out to someone. Somebody say someone. Someone that has survived the pandemic. Someone that is hurting. Someone whose soul is lost. Someone, amen, who's down in the valley and they want to get out. Someone, somebody say someone. And the reason why you want to reach out and reach someone, because somebody reached you. Hello, somebody. So we want you to be mindful of that. Don't be stingy with your Jesus. Amen. Don't be stingy with your Jesus. At this time, we're going to ask if Minister Antonio Tate, if you'll come and lead us to the throne of grace. How many of y'all believe prayer still works? I said, how many of y'all believe prayer still works? Somebody.
color. We can see each other. We can greet each other. What we missed, I'm so glad to see you. I am glad to see you, Eddie. Everybody by their hands. Father, I thank you for giving us this day. I thank you for waking us up just one more day. Because we don't know the minute, second, or hour that we'll be out of here. But Father, I thank you for allowing us to see each other, to greet each other. Just to pray together. Father, thank you for everybody that's here. Yes, Lord. I thank you for everybody that's not here no more. Lord, cover us in the blood. Yes, Lord. Cover our pastor. Yes, Cover our families. Yes, Lord. Cover his family. Yes, Lord. Cover the congregation here, Lord. Yes. Because we know that we have lost many friends, sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers. <clears throat> and Lord, cover us. I am so glad to see you one more time in the house of the Lord. Father, continue to bless us, giving us grace, giving us mercy, just giving us air to breathe. Because we know, Lord, you didn't have to give us air today. Amen. We know, Father, that we care for one another. Yes. And we try to listen and obey your commandments. But it's hard, Lord. Father, it's hard out here. But we know that you have our back. Just like you had everyone else. Yes, Lord. Father, we pray for finances. Mm -hmm. We pray that you give us character to be able to grow and grow closer to you, Father. We want to be just like you. Holy, clean, and with a fresh heart. Continue to give us life until you say it's time for us to go, Lord. Let us continue to be good to one another. Let us pray together. Let us fast together. Let us come together because we need you. We all need you. <laughs> Father, bless us as we go into these troubled waters. Fighting our enemies on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Fighting our giants that's on our back. Give us the strength to carry through. Yes, Lord. We know how hard it is out here. Mm -hmm. But Father, only you, only you can pull us through. Mm -hmm. Give us the knowledge to know that we cannot do it alone. And we cannot do it by ourselves, Lord. Give us the mercy to be able to give you the honor and the glory every day, every minute, every second. Because, Father, we know that you're the only one that can give us that honor of being at the pearly gates. Take our flesh from our minds and cleanse our spirits and our, and our souls so we can carry on your blessings and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, that was mail for my mailbox. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Brother Shay, Brother Malachi. Allow the Lord to use you.
job of God to a better job of all than you will. Matter of fact, I've seen it. I've seen it happen. The same folk. The same folk. Brother Leroy, the same folk. The same folk I prayed for. Had to call on me for something. And I'll tell you what I did, Sister Jessica. Instead of acting like boo boo the fool. Hello. The Lord said, I'm watching you. And I wanted to do some stuff, Stella. When they call on me. But the Lord said, uh uh. Do good and don't render evil for evil. I promise you, the Lord will break them down. Oh, yes, He will. Oh, yes, he will. Yes, he will. So, I'm trying to help you, you'll live longer, you'll have better health, you'll sleep better. Amen. So, if you want the windows of heaven to open up and let it rain down on you, start raining down some prayer on your people and persons that have hurt you, disappointed you, betrayed you. I promise you, they're having more pain than you are. Because if a person has to turn you down to build themselves up, that's a very insecure, hurting person. Would you agree with that? If you receive that, give God a hand of praise today. To those of you that are watching as well, we want to bid you God's speed. We unapologetically stand before you today to preach to you on Gileon, the good news of Jesus Christ. Today we're going to grapple with a subject that is somewhat challenging, something that I didn't think nor perceive that I would be preaching on this blessed day. And my Spirit was led to Isaiah chapter 5. And it's a very interesting passage of scripture. Um, it's not one that you will find packing out churches. It deals with oftentimes those things that we don't want to deal with. And the prophetical preacher must deal with some hot topics. And it's not always comfortable. But God is more concerned about your devotion than your comfort. He's more concerned about your character than your comfort. And so God has a very unusual way to pull you out of your comfort zone. And so this particular passage of scripture in this pericope of Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. Isaiah is called the eagle-eyed prophet because he is the one that say, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That's Isaiah. So we ask if you would at this time stand for the reading of the word. Isaiah. So glad to see you. There's still some folk believing coming to church. Amen. I think one Sunday I'm cutting off the online service and everything. Uh, we just going to have church in here. So folks standing home being lazy, you will miss out. Amen. So we want to encourage you, don't get too comfortable. Amen. God did not allow the pandemic to pull you away from church. Let me try it again. And the time's going to come, you're going to want to be in somebody's church and not be able to get there. Keep living. Keep living. You're going to want to be there. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. Woe unto them 
that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. May be seated. I want to talk to you this morning, teach and preach. from this particular train of thought, the paradoxes of the Bible. Somebody say paradox. paradox. To cross that over, Sister Tyann, to cross that over, Brother Wesley, to cross that over to where you can put it in your pocket, fold it up, take it with you. Sister Kelly, the central aim of the message, or the fry, will deal with fundamentals, morals, and principles. So I'm going to be somewhat um, clinical this morning. Um, the older I get, the more clinical I become in thought. When I was younger, They'll tell you, I used to walk pews. How many of y'all remember me walking pews? Tamika, all the way back there where Tamika said. I'd walk one by one. Somebody be looking and say, oh, I hope you don't fall. So it's Judy, I never did fall. I slipped. <laughs> Amen. Kendall, the Lord caught me. We celebrate Sister Kendall. She just turned 16. Let church say amen. amen. Come on, man. Growing up, growing up, amen, growing up. Fundamentals, morals, principles. The dictionary defines fundamental. As forming a necessary base or core of central importance. Such as the protection of fundamental human rights. Just recently with the support of good upstanding citizens such as you in Fayette County. The council voted 10 to 5 in favor of a permanency, a permanent ban on no knock warrant. Let me come to this side. Y'all ain't been happy about that. <laughs> we concluded as the community that if we had any say so in the matter, there would not be another Breonna Taylor incident. Can you imagine? Fundamental. Can you imagine? working all day long to help protect <laughs> yeah, law enforcement, help to aid law enforcement, work alongside law enforcement. And only to discover, Sister Sherry, that there you are trying to rest from your labor that the same people you're trying to help aid and assist kick in your door 
in the middle of your rest and take your life. What if that was your sister? Huh? Your child, your daughter, your mother. So we have a choice to sit and do nothing because they're not going to give us anything. Let me try it again. They're not going to give us anything unless we fight for it. And we've got to wake up and smell the coffee. Hello, somebody. You work your fingers to the bone. Or they may acknowledge you on your birthday, but when come time for you to get your paycheck, come time for you to get promoted, hello somebody, you're always looked over. And if by chance they do promote you, watch this, they try to do what is called the Peter Principle and promote you to failure because they realize you're not capable of really managing Management in the capacity in which they are, are you listening to me, in which they deem you to do so. So they promote you hoping that you would take the job in order to fail you. Amen. And to fail you means to flunk you. To flunk you means to fire you. They write you up. And then they terminate you. Guess what? And no pay. I think I said something. So they're just not going to give you nothing. So you got to fight. Sit there and look the other way. Sit there and act like ain't nothing happening. Now to stand up for your rights. It's your fundamental right as a taxpayer. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm Fundamental. In the adjective, it means the protection of, an example is the fundamental of human rights. I just gave an example. In, in the now perspective, Brother Wesley, it's a lesson. It, 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 it covers the moral of a story of a story or a concept in which one believes. In other words, fundamental, Sister Kelly, Sister Judy, is a person's standards of behavior or beliefs concerning what is and is not acceptable for them to do. And I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but there are some people who don't have a clue what I'm talking about. So it is my job to help highlight just the, the brevity of Minister Tay's what fundamentals are. You, ma'am, you, sir, should have and ought to have some fundamentals about your belief, about your life, what you stand for, what you will accept, what you will not accept. Somebody say fundamentals. Okay, preacher, you talk about fundamentals, but what about principles? Talk about fundamentals, we get that gap. Gave us two examples. Principles is a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as the foundation. Are y'all with me? The foundation of a system or belief. You have your fundamentals, but you need a foundation. You need principles to stand on. Such as a chain of reason, Brother Freddie. Sunday school is designed to teach the basic principles of Christianity. Are y'all listening to me? It's a rule, it's a belief governing one's behavior, personal behavior. And some folks struggle to be true to their own principles. There are some things that you ought not get into because it's the principle. And you need to be clear and crystal clear regardless who supports me, regardless who sees it the way I see it, regardless 
It's the principle of the matter. I ain't flowing with it. Because, yeah, I have my principle. Are y'all with me? And you've heard, you've heard, you've heard, you've heard, you've heard, you've heard of phrases that kind of connect with what I'm sharing, such as, I don't roll like that. What that person is saying, I have a certain standard. You heard what some folks do, you, you hear them say, I'm not that type of person. Fundamentals, morals, principles. I hold myself to a higher standard. You hear people saying that, and what they're saying is, it's not going to be the type of party. Hmm? And basically what the person is trying to convey to you, I'm no cheap trick. I'm no quarter in a bubblegum machine and you turn me and I come rolling out and you chew me up until you chew all the sweetness out and you spit me out. Talk back to me if you can. I have a certain standard. You're not going to walk over me and treat me any kind of way and misuse me and abuse me. Amen. Y'all not saying nothing. Y'all not saying nothing. You know, it's just not going to happen because of my principles. And that's true not only in relationships, but that ought to be true in your Christian walk, in your personality, in your career, wherever you are in life, in your upbringing, wherever you are in life, there ought to be certain standards about yourself. And you may not be invited to the backyard barbecue. Well, keep your barbecue. I'll buy my own barbecue. <laughs> Sit on my own back porch and talk to the squirrels and amen and hang out with the sparrows and the red cart and the birds. And even a wild cat that comes through, I'm going to throw them a bone. Y'all not going to talk to me. Because if you don't invite me to your barbecue, guess what? Somebody else will. Yeah. Oh yeah, I know what I'm talking about. Hmm? And it'll probably taste better than yours. Help me, Kevin. <laughs> Morals has a lot to do, watch this, with your upbringing. Yeah. <laughs> the balance of right and wrong, the consciousness of your choices. Some folk may be gifted and talented. Y'all not gonna, not gonna like me today. Some folk may go to church, sit in church, read the word, work in the church, serve in the church, but have poor morals. I'm gonna say this, and I'm a father, so I gotta be careful. Some folk even have children, but still emulate, exhibit poor morals, and God is gonna hold. For how they raise their children. I don't care how you cut it. You're going to suffer in this life. And you got to stand before God in the next life. Morals. It was Bill Clinton that said I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> and it was also Bill Clinton that came back and said. In fact I did have sexual. <coughs> with that woman. He was grappling with not only the position as president, but his morals. And your morals ought to convict you for turning over in the graves right now because you were raised better. Y'all not going to pray with me. I told you, you're not going to like me today. You know better. I can see if I didn't teach you, but you know better. And when you know better, you ought to do better. A paradox is an action 
Here it is. Practice that is seemingly absurd. It's, it's almost like it's a statement that contradicts itself, but when investigated or explained, teach pastor, may prove to be well founded or true. It's tricky. Somebody say tricky. Despite the sound, despite the premise, there's a conclusion, Brother Taste, that seems logically unacceptable or self-contradictory. So it seems like it just doesn't make sense. It's a paradox. Unlike the world, Brother Wesley, yes. Yeah. Christians are to live by the biblical code of ethics. And what is hurting the growth and the power of the church, it's not praise, we do the praise, but it's our fundamentals. It's our principles. And sure enough, our morals. We who are in Christ believe in the infallibility of the word of God. What does that mean? We believe that the Bible is 100% trustworthy and without error. We believe that God has breathed upon the scriptures, deacon, that the life of God, the spirit of God, lives on the pages of the Holy Writ. It's not just another book. When you open your Bible, God is speaking to you. It's alive. It's well. It's been around a long time. For the word of God is eternal and alive. Matthew 24, 35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The Lord himself said that. The challenge is, the Holy Writ contains many paradoxes that seem uh, contradictory. They, they appear to be contradictory on the surface when paired next to one another. In other words, when you read one scripture over here and then you read another over there and they seem to contradict itself. And that's how cults and false doctrines and other beliefs amen, begin to yeah, cause us to feel uneasy about our belief in Christianity and as a child of God and belong to church. So they attack us by using one scripture against another scripture. And Brother Tony, since we don't come to Sunday school and since we don't study the Bible and since we don't know how many books are in the Bible and since we have no appetite to study to show ourselves approved under God, we become ignorant of Satan's devices. Because we don't know. And you can't teach what you don't know. Can't do it. What's that old attitude? If you want to hack something from a black person, put it in a book. Because we don't read like we should. We don't comprehend. We don't study. We got too many egotistical, attitudinal dispositions. So when we can't comprehend what you intellectually, we go get them. And I've met people, and so have you, that can't sit and have a conversation with you on an intellectual, even if we disagree. They can't disagree with you without going to the level, because in essence, what they are revealing is their lack to communicate, to converse with you in a proper manner, so they go get them. They can't handle you intellectually. And it's not that you're the smartest or the sharpest knife in the sin. It's just that they don't take out time to sharpen their own axe. So now they want to demean you. Well, she thinks she's so intelligent. No, she just read two more books than you. She ain't saying she's better than you, but she knows she's got that thing. And when you know you got it, you walk like you got it. You walk like you're somebody. You talk like you're somebody. 
You dress like you somebody because you are somebody. Are y'all listening to me? So knowledge is power. Power is knowledge. I don't know a thing about playing that on. I can play lean on me on the piano. One chord. Dum, 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 dum. Dum, 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 dum. Learned that in the projects. That's all I can do. But Malachi has the knowledge and the gift to teach. So I can have a conversation with Malachi about chords and keys and lyrics. And Malachi can go to another dimension of conversation with me and I'm lost. Now I got one or two things to do from there. Sister Judy, I can throw with him and learn from him. Or I can get on and say, you think you own that because you play on. You ain't all that, but you're black and white and all. I, play, I can play something too now. <laughs> or I can say, bro, well, Malachi, you know what? You're right, bro. I'm, I'm with you. I feel you on that. Uh, but I'm not as knowledgeable as you, and so perhaps I need to learn. You see where I'm going? But some folks won't go get on me. <laughs> because they can't help you emotionally, intellectually. Amen. Philosophically, they can't, they can't go there. Spiritually, they can't go there with you. So they get nasty. Everybody knows you can cuss. Try keeping your cool for a change. Everybody knows you don't care. Try caring for a change. Grow up with your insecurities. So when you are standing on your fundamentals and trying to help you on your principles and your morals, expect somebody to go get them. But don't you move. Somebody say, don't you move. Don't you move. Scriptures complement one another to reveal a more full picture. The danger is when one scripture is pulled out of context. It's pulled out of the contextual makeup of the scripture. And therein, it's just like this building that was built in 1975, according to the history cornerstone. If you pull out the wrong support beam. The contractor told me when we was looking at expanding, and I still believe in the rendering, I know it's still hanging out there on the wall, I know I haven't said much about it, but if we would have held ourselves together, we would have done it by now. Oh yeah, done, expanded, paid half of it all by now, by now we've been done. But we couldn't hold ourselves together. But what I learned from the engineer when he came, he said, Reverend, what you have in the walls are support beams. And these support beams hold the structure in place. If you move one of them, then the structure begins to collapse over a period of time. Let me try it again. <laughs> when you walk outside the church and you look at the structure of the church and you wonder why the bricks are more so situated like they are versus the because there are structure beams in there that is holding the whole building together. Y'all still in kitchen. If you pull one out and put it in the back, that side falls. Because you took it out of the foundational makeup of the building. So it is with the scriptures. People will take a passage of scripture from that side of the book of the Bible and put it over here on that side and it don't fit in. And what's so strange about it, I've seen folks shout off of that. I've seen folks step off into that. Unclear, clueless that what they shout about ain't gonna happen because it's out of contextual content. And so what happens in the paradoxes of the Bible, it seems like it's out of context. But it's not. Because in order for it to be out of context, but it fair implies and suggests that the Bible it has error. And it doesn't. I don't want to confuse you. But here's an example. Out of context. How many of y'all heard? Money is the root. Help me. I got one. Who's that? It's it. Of all evil. Help me, Judy. How many of y'all heard that? And then they'll go on and say, that's in the Bible. No, it ain't. The love of money 
is the root of all evil. Money is not evil. Matter of fact, God created wealth. And money was created to be our servant. And you hear people say, well, they got that money, and money corrupted them. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. They got that promotion. They got the big hit. No. What the, the promotion? Got that car. I don't even know nobody no more. Uh-uh. That ain't one. Got that house. And now they think they got it going on. Uh-uh. What happens to us, watch this. God bless you. The more resources we have, the more it reveals the true character in us. So, stay philosophical with it. So, if I have more money, Brother Freddy, what it does, Sister Nico, it gives me more options. And my options are indicative, Mother Fry, of my personality, my makeup, and my character. So, if I'm ghetto, the more money I get, the more ghetto I'm going to be. You ain't got to say nothing. And I've seen people, and so have you, that have acquired money and end up blowing it in the wind. Turn around and say, what happened? I blew it. Instead of having enough sense to reach down in integrity and get some wisdom and take the money, put it up, invest it, put it in the market, money, money market fund, let it flip, let it turn, let it accumulate, no. Then they want to bling bling. They want to go out and have a party. They want to go out and, like, no. You are revealing your, watch this, character of instability. In other words, you have poor management skills. Poor. Get a nice house, thank you all that. No, the house don't make you. Help me somebody. You make the house. Get a new car, diamond in the back, some rooftop, digging the same one against the wing. You still got a monkey rap. You don't make the car, the car makes you. You make the car look good. Get new clothes, walk around with your hair stuck up like a peacock. Amen. You still ain't got it going on. When you get in the outfit, the outfit gets excited because you are in it. You missed it. I know I'm somebody. I walk with integrity. I walk with confidence. So money brings you out of you. It reveals, just like power does. You see people get in power, they get crazy. Some folks get power, they know how to maintain. They know how to, they, they're, they're very disciplined. Some become undisciplined. All the power did was brought out of them what's in them. See people in relationships, since y'all so quiet today, get in a relationship, it could be a good one. But some folks just can't handle a good woman or a good man. Y'all yeah, yeah. ain't got to say that. I'm going to preach it in tonight. Yeah, yeah. And you praying and asking God to see you somebody good and cool, calm, and together. No, it ain't going to happen. Why? Because you messed up. And if he connects Michelle Obama with you, since you ain't Barack, and you Jack Dirty Nicholson, you're going to mess Michelle up. So what God says, until you get like Barack, y'all not going to pray with me. Until you get yourself together, I'll send you somebody. That's why some folks trip out now like that. They got their credit score 800. Come to find out you got a 400 credit score, they trip out. Because they didn't know Freddy Krueger lived inside of you. Oh yeah, it's going to get deep. So it brings out, somebody said brings out. I thank God for all the gifts that God has given me. God has given me gifts. I thank God for it. And people have tried to make me something I'm not. Well, he's a people pleaser. He's an entertainer. He, I know what I am. And I know what I'm not. But I ain't going to stop using my gifts. Are y'all with me? It brings out of me what God put in me and what my mother taught me. Glory to his name. Somebody talked about me today, Brother Freddie, because I had on purple. Well, he think he's doing it today, you know. He's going to be on. No, I wore purple because I wanted to wear purple. Just like you wore what you wanted to wear. 
but it still does not change my fundamentals, my principles, and my morals. Are y'all trying to hear what I'm saying? One of the biblical responsibilities of a pastor in John 21 and 17, it is not Antonio Tate's responsibility to preach in this pulpit. It is not. He preaches in this pulpit by way of appointment of the pastor. And there's a reason why. Because an associate minister is associated as a licentiate to preach the gospel as often as it is allowed to the world. Which means that an associate licentiate minister is, amen, assisting the pastor to carry out the mandates of the gospel. But it is not his responsibility to feed you. You can't have a one pastor. Because anything with two heads is a freak. And when you read John chapter 21, you'll find the Lord saying to Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. It is my job, and it's an awesome task. And yes, I appreciate Minister Taste. I appreciate the help of the deacon. I appreciate all of that to assist me. But it's my task. Somebody say my task. And if you don't look for nobody else to show up, you look for your pastor. Oh, let me try this out. You look for your pastor. If nobody else is there, full of fire, ready to go, Brother Wesley, I ought to be the pastor. Hmm? You sit there with your head hot, with your head hung over your heart heavy, and in walks the pastor. The pastor don't show up, Sister Beverly. Guess what? Everybody else is there, but if the pastor ain't there, somebody say, "Where's the pastor?" Where he at? <laughs> Come on, help me here. It is his responsibility and his assignment according to Acts chapter 20 and 28 whom the Holy Ghost has made you overseer to feed all the flock which Jesus has purchased with his own blood which means I don't own nothing and neither do you. It is his responsibility he is. To feed the sheep. Why? Because, Brother Taste, there are wolves. Jessica in sheep's clothing. And what they will do is devour you. And that's why we have to be careful how we guard the pulpit. Everybody ain't preaching here. No, not here. I don't care if you do like it. Everybody is not preaching from here because it is my responsibility. And one day, I got to give an account. For your souls. How many of y'all would like to stand in line with me? When the Lord says, how well did you feed them? How, how often were you there? Were you committed? Did you give them your best? It's his responsibility. Because there are wolves and prophets who prey on the sheep. So the pastor must always be on duty. He has to manage. He has to teach. He has to give oversight to leadership. He has to protect the pulpit at all costs. He has to stand as God's watchman because the pulpit, contrary to popular opinion, the pulpit is where the battle is. And it's where the word of God goes forth. And you've heard of Amber Alert before I close. Preach. Amber Alert means when a child is missing or has been abducted, there's a nationwide Amber Alert that goes all over the world. A description of the missing child is given. The last whereabouts, the subject, the suspect, what the child was wearing, the license plate info. There's a toll-free number to call, and other line of information are given to contact the necessary people, the persons, and officials to locate where the child is to give information so the child can be found. Well, I'll stop now on my way to heaven to convey to you there's a biblical alert. Because the modern day church is oftentimes guilty of compromising the truth for a lie. And that's what's happening in this text. How many of y'all would agree with me? 
that oftentimes we refuse to stand for the truth. Y'all didn't even say amen. I got one amen out there. Let me try it again. Oftentimes we refuse to stand for the truth. We fall prey because if you don't stand for something, you won't fall for something. And so since we don't stand for the truth like we should, we sit there and look wise and otherwise when we know truth is truth. So since we don't, hold on brother, since we don't stand for the truth, we fall prey by getting in and appealing to the viewpoints, emotions, human philosophies, lifestyles, and opinions of a wicked, wild, wayward, ungodless, reckless, sinful, sordid world. Everything is acceptable now. Everything. Anything is permissible now. Everybody's going to heaven now. Hell is vacant. Ain't nobody going to hell. Everybody's going to heaven. I can't hear too well. I said I can't hear too well. Fundamentals, morals, and principles are thrown out and replaced with compromise, doctrine of devils, perversion, iniquity, and wickedness. And y'all won't say amen. I'm concerned. Oh, yes, I am. I'm not giving all of my years in life of preaching and trying to live right and trying to treat folk and act like I'm not concerned. I'm concerned. I said, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about this generation. I'm concerned about my children's generation. I'm concerned about my grandchildren's generation. I'm concerned. I'm concerned. I'm concerned. Are you concerned? Keep talking about we keep going to funerals. Keep talking about our young people this. Our young, well, let's hit the rewind button. Let's see how they got to where they are. We're living in dangerous times. You ain't got to say nothing. Hypocritical times. And I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm talking about stuff we know we ought not be doing. And there is the lure of the devil. Like the spider web of the black widow designed to entrap and suck us in to manipulate the mindset of the believer that it's okay to mix in. And that it's okay to fit in. And it's okay to look like the world and dress like the world and act like the world and retaliate like the world. There are some things on your social media posts as a child of God that should not be posted. I don't care what you think about it. You represent the most high God. And you are covered in the blood of the Lamb. And if your children see you do it, and if your nieces see you do it, and if your little cousins see you do it, and if your next door neighbors see you do it, what else? What you are telling them is that I'm just like y'all. No, we're not. We are called to be different. Live different, act different. I've seen some stuff out there that is shameful. Some comments that are made that are shameful. Y'all not gonna talk to me. Some likes that are degrading as a child of the living God. There's some stuff I just, I, I'm almost to the place of point of deleting my whole social media. I really am. I mean, I mean, it's stuff that pops up that just don't make sense. Get a life. Hello, somebody. I said, get a life. Get the joy of life, the God quality of life. And you wonder why nobody wants to come to your church. No, you wonder why nobody wants to get in the kingdom of heaven. You wonder why nobody believes there's power in prayer. I tell you why. Check yourself or you wreck yourself. This text helps us to know it's sad. We live in a day and time. It's hard to tell who's who. Who goes to church, who don't go to church. Who's in church, who ain't in church. Who's living right, who ain't. It's hard to tell. Somebody say hard to tell. Isaiah chapter 5 deals with six woes. Woe. 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 Talks about greed and ungodly lifestyle and mockers of God, idolatry, people, the 
deceiving themselves. Corruption and political injustice system and drunkenness and idolatry and immorality. And Deacon Tony, he's not talking to the world. Freddie, the prophet is not talking to the boys and girls on the corner. The prophet is talking to the church. That's who he's talking to. Somebody say, whoa. Whoa ain't good. No, it ain't good. Whoa is a term of judgment. It means deep suffering, affliction. Whoa. It will not go with it. Whoa, judgment is coming your way. So he gives Sister Rita an illustration of a vineyard. Chapter 5. Tie in. Here's what he does. Here's what he does. Here's what he does, Alicia. Here's what he does, Aunt Ross. Here's what he does. Here's what he does. He paints a beautiful picture of a vineyard. He stands out in a public place. And the picture that he paints is God's people are themselves the vineyard. Here's the picture. Instead of yielding up good grapes of righteousness and justice, they yielded up wild grapes, wickedness and injustice. And the fourth woe in chapter 5, verse 20 says, Woe to them who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Well, if you take your finger and go back to chapter 4, you read, I mean, chapter 5, look at verse 4. Verse 4, you know what the Lord says? What could I have done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? That's a powerful statement. You know what the Lord is saying? The Lord is saying, I've done all I could with you. There's nothing more I can do with you. You have put me in a position to where judgment must come. Now, when God says, I've done all I can with you, y'all miss it. That means that you've reached a state that is so low in base that God is saying, you're almost like Solomon the Lord. I got to wipe you out because if I, don't, if I don't judge you, if I don't chastise you, you're going to be like a germ. You're going to be like a COVID-19 virus and you're going to spread all over the world. So what I got to do is put you in check to teach others what will happen if they fall into this state. Oh, it's deep. It's deep. Despite all the work that the prophets had done, Lord help me, my mind is starting to hit the rewind button. Despite all the preaching, despite all the praying, despite all the serving, despite all Today's mindset is, I don't care. 
What will be, will be. It is what it is. Well, I'll just suffer. Take the consequences. Take my chances. I accept my fate. The Lord just won't have to forgive me. No, he ain't just got to forgive you. Hello, somebody. That's the new norm of thinking. And after everybody else concludes, they get in a little group and they say, well, you know, everybody else is doing it wrong. The devil is alive. Everybody else is not doing it and neither should we. The Old Testament says in Numbers 23 and 19 that God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. He has said and shall he not do what he said? He has spoken and shall he not make it good? Y'all don't like the Old Testament. New Testament, Romans chapter 3 verse 4. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but let every man be a liar, which means that God will always have a remnant a chosen generation a people who are called out of darkness to his marvelous light who value and live by biblical fundamentals wholesome morals god fearing principles check your friends list you might just be connected to the wrong crowd why is it that everybody that's attracted to you amen is mean low down conniving and scandalous how many of y'all know you got a sweet around your own front door before you can sweep around somebody else. The believer must never submit to no. I know it's hard. I know it's tough. Amen. I try myself to keep myself together. I know it's tough. Somebody say tough. I know it's hard. Amen. But you must never support pleasure seekers of this world. For it is written in John, 1 John 2.15 Love not the world. Somebody say love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust thereof is passing away. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. And I don't know how y'all feel about it, but I want to do God's will. I want to live for God to the best of my ability. I want to be known for one who is a child of God. Because Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. And I don't want to be one where God looks at and says, why did you succumb? Why did you bend over? Why did you compromise? In the midst of a degrading world, a foul world, a world that is going to hell in a handbasket after all. I said, I can't hear nobody. So the scriptures can be misunderstood. They can be twisted. They can be stripped of their true meaning. So I've chosen to grapple with a very difficult subject, biblical paradoxes. Why? Glad you asked. To guard against deceptive, flattering words, smooth talk, who, by the way, are not bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. To help you to be on alert. When somebody comes around tripping. Old school said, if it's a spade, call it a spade. And how many of y'all know that, yeah, <laughs> good trees cannot produce evil fruit. Huh? And neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Apple trees don't grow oranges, they grow apples. And you'll know them by the fruit they bear. So quit tripping. Old school taught if it's a spade, it's a spade. If it's a peach, it's a peach. If it's a person who shows you who they are, you better believe that's who they are. If they're good hearted, they're going to show you. If they mean spirited, you're going to see it. If they're kind, crazy, selfish, you're going to see that. If they're forgiven, you're going to know that. Whatever you see, you'll know them by the fruits they bear. So there are many paradoxes. I'm going to give you a couple and I'll bet you for a while. One is a worthless workmanship. For we find in Luke, watch me, 17 and 10. It states we are unprofitable, worthless servants. But the same Bible in Ephesians 2 and 10 says we are his workmanship. It sounds like it's contradictory. In one passage, 
It says that we are worthless servants. But then it says, yeah, keep tell in Ephesians 2 and 10, it says that we are his workmanship. How is it that both statements are true? That people are both worthless and workmanship. Here it is. What the Bible is teaching that apart from Christ, we are worthless. But when Christ is working in us, we are profitable. And that lets me know that he is the vine and we are the branches. And apart from him, we can do nothing. So what this means is I can do all things. I shall be unprofitable. And no one of the songwriters said, only what you do for Christ will last. So it's not by might and it's not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And I'm glad that I can't do it by myself. I'm glad that I need the Lord to help me to be a man, a workman. A workman that need not be ashamed. Ain't God all right? The Bible says, Blessed are they who hunger in Matthew 5 and 6. And in John 6 and 35, the same Bible says, No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. Let me say it again. Blessed are those who hunger. Ain't God all right? And then it says, No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. Hungry. And so what the text is teaching of is spiritual hunger. And what the Lord is saying, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And that lets me know that in this world, there's many things you can feed on. There's many things you can drink up. You ever met somebody that connected with somebody? It may have been a flame from the past. It may have been, yeah, a moment in the moment. And they can't help but tell somebody. Because she, when is good to you, you're going to tell somebody. And God already you. you ever met somebody that told you in one phase of the year how good it was. But then you talk to them, they go down the road. Because can't nobody do like the Lord. And basically what they're saying is, I had an appetite for this, and I had a thirst for that. But I discovered that, that can't nobody, there won't be nobody that can fix me like Jesus. Try this and I'll try that. But I've come to the conclusion you better try.
in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. I got to leave you now, not because I don't have any more preaching and singing in me, but because the time is of the essence. But I want you to know today that God is able, even in the midst of a foul, mean, abusive, seedy, scandalous, low-down world. Don't be like them. Because they have no morals, make sure you've got morals. Because they don't have fundamentals, make sure you've got fundamentals.
string over the altar. Sister Kelly, we ask that you come and read this to the congregation after you pray this. Right up.
Amen. We have Mother Fry. Ranks is getting thin. Hello, somebody. Brother Cecil. Brother Ron. Who else we got? Freddie, Aunt Royce, Leroy. Who else we got? Maxine. We got others. Hey, Ross said, don't put me in that number. All right. But the numbers are getting 10. You see what I'm trying to say? You see what I'm talking about? They're getting 10. Amen. Getting 10. We're going to leave Amy Ross alone. She's still 21. She's still a young lady. Let us stand. God bless you. Thank you for your patience. God
tell somebody to do something nice before you leave here. Tell somebody something nice, put a smile on somebody's face.